Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 16, let's hear the word of the Lord together. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own prophets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them was Dionysius, the Oropagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, routinely used to ask young men aspiring to be preachers a question during the start of their probationary period. Actually, he asked them two questions. The first question was this, has anyone been converted under your ministry thus far? The second question he asked was, did anyone become angry with you after hearing you preach? Now, if the prospective student answered no to both of those questions, Wesley would break the news that he didn't think the Lord had called that particular man to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, the Apostle Paul preached a sermon in Athens more than 2,000 years ago, and some scholars have surmised that it was a flop. Can you imagine? They argue that for the same two reasons that Wesley would inform a ministerial candidate that God probably wasn't calling him to preach, that Paul had failed. 
in that one, it never resulted in a church being planted there, and two, it never resulted in any persecution for the Apostle Paul. I strongly disagree on both of those counts. Today I would like to propose to you that before we label any evangelistic effort a success or a failure, we need to be reminded that in every proclamation of the gospel there are three separate factors that deserve equal consideration. First, the congregation. That's you or the audience. The second is the preacher and the sermon itself. And then thirdly, there is the matter of tangible results. What happened or didn't happen? Now, since by God's grace, we'll soon be launching a new children's ministry aimed at evangelization, especially evangeliz evangelization of those whom the Lord is pleased to bring to First Baptist Church, we do well to consider the question, how will we measure success? People will want to know. That's a fair question. The Kids Discovery Club, or for that matter, any ministry of the local church is a test not only of the audience whom we're trying to reach, but it's also a test of the one who delivers the message. That being the case, let's first consider the audience or the congregation. Athens, as you may know, was what today you would probably call a university town. Culturally and intellectually, it was a place for people who were proud of their IQ, who gravitated toward architecture. It was the Harvard or Yale of the first century. The artists, the orators, the philosophers of Athens were all there. They were the cream of the crop, the best of the best. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Zeno, Epicurus all played a major role in forming the culture just as New York City and Los Angeles play a role in shaping the morals of America, whether we care to admit it or not. The people of Athens enjoyed debate for the sake of debate. They thrived on a diet of speculation, argument, discussion, and rebuttal as a baby thrives on milk. Paul's audience in Athens, Greece, had curious and inquiring minds which were very content to deal in abstractions, speculations, and hypotheses without ever nailing down a firm decision one way or the other. They were liked to be, as we say, neutral minded. They preferred to keep ideas at arm's length because they were in the habit of avoiding anything that spoke of or called for a personal commitment. Their problem was not a lack of information or a lack of clarity, they had both. Their basic problem was inertia. They wouldn't commit to anything, especially anything that demanded a change in their behavior. G.K. Chesterton put it this way, quote, merely having an open mind is nothing. The object of opening the mind as of opening the mouth is to shut it again on something solid. In fact, some people have such an open mind as you well know that they, in fact, have, their brains have fallen out. For example, within the audience of the Mars Hill uh, congregation, there were members from two opposing philosophical schools, the Stoics and the Epicureans. The Stoics were essentially pantheists. They were materialistic and they were fatalistic. Nature was their god. They believed that all nature was moving toward a great climax, although they didn't know exactly what that climax was. By contrast, the Epicureans were sensualists. Their goal was to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Their experience was grounded in not reason, but in actual physical contact. In any case, both schools of philosophy denied the existence of a personal God who took interest in the personal lives of men and women. Now in every audience, in every congregation, we have intellectuals, and please don't conclude that that's a bad thing. It's a good thing. The mind of man is incredibly important to true religion as it is in mathematics. Nowhere does the Bible suggest that when we become a Christian, we shift our mind into neutral. Jesus answered many intellectual arguments in his day, such as the one that came from an expert in the law who tried to quiz him by asking, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? 
And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Many people today are held prisoner by their emotions. They're using their emotions more than they're using their mind. Now, emotion is also a vital and valid part of the Christian faith. It is the apparatus by which we show love. But Jesus said that love for God must involve the intellect. It must involve the mind as well as the heart and the emotions. 1 Peter 1.13 says it this way, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Did you hear that? Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. The Christian is meant to enlist all faculties in faith. All faculties. Now, having said that, in sharing the gospel, we have to be careful to present the gospel in an orderly and logical way so far as the facts are already given to us in the word of God. Any haphazard presentation that is thrown together and ends up muddying the water is a dishonor to the gospel. This means that we have to be prepared for what we say. The Bible says, be ready always to give to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you and to do it with fear and trembling. Did you hear that? Be ready always. If somebody walked up to you in the parking lot as you were about to enter your car, the question is, could you present the gospel in a straightforward, clear, and uncomplicated way to that person? That's what that means. Be ready at any time to present the gospel. Now, that brings us to the second element in presenting the gospel. Beside the congregation, there is the preacher or the evangelist himself. Paul's sermon was a sincere effort to reach people who were virtually foreigners, you have to understand, to the Old Testament scriptures. Paul was first moved by what he saw. He was there in Athens. He was waiting for Timothy and Silas. And as he was waiting, he was looking over the city. He was looking over the temples. He was looking over the statuary. He was looking over the idolatry. And he was moved by what he saw. The whole city was given over to idols. And actually, the word used in verse 16 to describe Paul's sense of agitation upon seeing all the pagan statuary and the pagan temples to the Greeks and their gods and goddesses is the word paroxysm, a violent emotional distress over the danger and folly the people were in. A paroxysm. Now may I ask you, how does it make you feel when you drive along the roads and the interstates and you see a kingdom hall, how does it make you feel? How does it make you see the world around us when you see adult bookstores? How does it make you feel when you see Jehovah Witnesses out knocking door to door? I was in Utah for an extended period of time a couple of years ago, and I was overwhelmed by the fact that the Mormons had a church in practically every little village that I came to as I drove some 500 miles. In some cases, it was the only church in that village or town. And I was shocked. How does it stir you to see people flocking to Walmart on Sunday morning while the churches in America sit empty? Or for that matter, the churches are being systematically abandoned and sold because of inadequate funds to support it. How does it make you feel? Now, the condition of the evangelist before delivering the message says a lot about the message itself. 
if we are not moved, if we're not passionate, if we're not brought to anger and disgust at the erosion of truth and the concerted growth of evil in our society, there's a problem right there from the beginning. And that's a problem to be confessed to Almighty God without delay. Because it means that we've become apathetic, we've become indifferent, we've become accepting, culturally accommodating to every form of sliding away into Sodom and Gomorrah. How does it make you feel? Paul began then with the message. He began by telling them that they were very religious. He called their attention to their innate impulse to adoration and respect. Please never assume that because a person says, I am not a religious person, that they are not a religious person. If you trace their life, if you watch their movements through the day, if you see their checkbook and how they spend money, if you watch what they entertain themselves by, if you see where they go when they're in trouble, it could very well reveal that they are very religious. They rely on something. It may be material, it may be physical, it may be pleasure, it may be social, but Paul zeroed in on exactly one altar with one inscription, to the unknown God. It offered Paul a compelling opportunity to present the gospel, and in a sense, Paul says, since you have made provision that in all of your pantheon of gods, you may not have covered all of the bases, and so you've erected this one altar to the unknown God. Now let me tell you about this unknown God. And Paul's sermon declared what could be known about the unknown God. Because the unknown God has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose again the third day. And so Paul goes into an explanation of several things about this unknown God. First, he's the creator of the world. Second, he doesn't live in temples and doesn't need images carved by human hands. Third, he's made all nations from one blood, Adam and Eve. So the Athenians did not come from the soil of their beloved Greece. They came because God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them. Male and female he created them. Fourthly, also contrary to the deists' philosophies of the day, this God does not have, this God <clears throat> is not indifferent to the world. He has and takes a real interest in the world, in the times and places. And he has set times, and he has established times, beginning and ending. And finally, Paul told them, this God, this unknown God, desires a relationship with his creation. But he's not accessible through gold, through silver, through stone images, through automobiles, through house appliances, through art or anything else. He's available through faith only in the grace that God has extended in the person of Jesus Christ. And finally, he's appointed Jesus Christ as judge by virtue of his resurrection from the dead. He's been declared with power 
to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Now, Paul knew the citizens of Athens wouldn't uh, be familiar again with the Old Testament, so he quoted from their own poets, uh, and he used quotes about the gods and applied them to the living God in heaven. Now, let me stop there and ask a question. Haven't we all heard people who, as soon as something is mentioned about religion, seem to turn us off. But Paul used some of their own images, their own poets, their own history. Now, maybe it would be helpful to remind us that in this world that's becoming increasingly pluralistic, one thing does not change. Human beings are incredibly selfish. Keep that in mind. Human beings have a devious heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And thirdly, the heart is incredibly hungry. And only truth will satisfy it. Many who may seem that they are indifferent to God, we could ask a few general questions. Have you ever stared up into the heavens at night and looked at the stars and felt like there has to be something behind their silent beauty? The Hubble telescope just recently discovered yet another galaxy millions of miles away. Have you ever been present to see a newborn baby and wonder at the mystery of life? Where it comes, how it comes about, and where it's headed. Have you ever been stirred to the depths of your soul by some musical piece? some drama, maybe a real life drama of another person and what they went through. Has a movie ever really captured your deepest emotions? Have you ever planted a garden and wondered at the transformation of a seed, a tiny seed that you put in the soil to become a stock five or six feet tall or a tomato vine with dozens of tomatoes? If they answer yes to any of these questions, then it's our pleasure and our responsibility to tell them that you also have an altar to the unknown God in your heart. And instead of wasting precious spiritual energy and effort trying to chase down a dozen different temples and a dozen different religious experiences and a dozen different gods that will leave you empty, you can turn at once to the one true God who came to earth and indwelt his own son. And he will give you his Holy Spirit, and his Holy Spirit will come in and bear witness with your spirit that you actually are a child of God. You're not a mistake. You're not here by accident. You're not unknown. This God doesn't invite. He commands us to repent of our sin and receive him as Savior and Lord now before we have to stand before him as judge. And again, that's when I receive the Holy Spirit and give glory to God like the stars. That's how I'm intended to experience the miracle of being born again. That's how I can hear the sweetest music stirring my soul. That's how I can perceive the idea of a seed being sown in the soil of my heart that will produce the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, self-control. That's the content of Paul's sermon on Mars Hill. And it's the essence of the gospel still today in this culture where people's hearts and minds are empty and they're hungry and they're searching for something that is lasting, something that will satisfy them. Now, having unpacked Paul's congregation and Paul's message, his sermon, now 
in verses 32 through 34, we come to the matter of results. Let's be honest and say that it's never possible to measure accurately the results of any sermon. It's tempting to judge success by numbers and tangible results should be produced. We're not saying that. But that doesn't always tell the whole story, does it? Just back up and read about Thessalonica, which basically threw Paul out and the other missionaries out of the city, and yet a church was established there. As far as we know, no church was ever established in Athens. And immediately, the response to Paul's sermon wasn't very encouraging. Some said he seems to be a seed picker. That is, somebody who goes around and picks up little things here and there and brings them together as his own presentation, his own thoughts. Then they said he seems to be a speaker of strange gods. He talks about somebody who died and rose again. Well, there were some that just said, let's, let's hear him again, though. Let's hear him again at some other time. You know what that is, don't you? That's the demon of procrastination. We'll delay a decision until we hear Paul again. But the people whose lives are touched and secretly changed are not always on the church rosters. Uh, they're not always in the pews. And how their lives are changed is not always written up in a newsletter uh, or made into a video or made into a movie. We only know that this fellow Dionysius and the woman Damaris quietly attached themselves to Paul and they believed the gospel. That is along with others. Their eternal destiny was changed from darkness to light, from death to life. And for them, Paul's efforts were not in vain. Now, I often refer to Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers. One day he preached a sermon so poorly that he was ashamed of himself and as he walked away from the church back home the metropolitan tabernacle in london he wondered how any good could possibly come out of the sermon that he preached when he arrived home he dropped to his knees and he prayed lord god you can do something with nothing bless that poor sermon in the months that followed, 41 people said they had decided to trust Christ as their savior because of that weak message. The following Sunday, to make up for his, what he thought was his previous failure, Spurgeon then preached what he thought was a great sermon. But no one responded. And Spurgeon's experience underscores two important lessons for us, for anyone who wants to be an evangelist, to serve the Lord, to spread the word. First, we need the blessing of God in our efforts. And that's why we've been emphasizing all through this preparatory stages of the Kids Discovery Club ministry, we've been constantly hammering at prayer unless the Lord builds the house they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord keeps watch over the city, the watchman wakes in vain. And second, our weakness is an occasion for the display of God's power. This same apostle uh, Paul later said in another city of Greece, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, and in distresses. I take pleasure in those things. Why? For when I'm weak, then I am strong. You know what, I, I have a hunch that we get confused. We think that God only uses new things people that are whole, 
experiences that are just a wonderful victory. That's not what God uses. He uses broken people. He uses people who've failed. He's used people who have disappointed themselves, disappointed their family, and disappointed Almighty God. He uses people who will humble themselves and come back to the foot of the cross and say, I'm a sinner. God be merciful to me, a sinner. So I'm going to close this morning. Let me be blunt and ask this. What kind of congregation are you? Some of you have been in this congregation for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. What do you intend to do with the gospel that you've heard? Secondly, what is the content of the sermon that you give out? You're preaching a gospel each day. by the things that you do and the words that you say. Men, read what you write, whether faithless or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? Finally, what is the result? Are you content to politely dismiss what you have heard or maybe procrastinate? Or will you be among those like Dionysius and Damaris whose hearts were turned? Just remember this. There is much rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents than over all the just persons that need no repentance. There's music in heaven and you can make it happen.